it's as always a great honor to come and to speak to you and to try to pers uh, try to explain some of the work that's been done um, by almost always members of my team and certainly I take almost no credit for this um, and so I'm going to show some of the information that they have gleaned in the last year um, which I hope you will agree is very exciting. It's always difficult to follow my friend and colleague Vin Paleri. Um, I can assure you that there will be no gory photographs in my... <laughs> well I guess it depends on your definition of a gory photograph but there'll be no gory photographs in my presentation. So what I would like to talk to you about this evening just for the next 10 minutes or so is um, how can we make immunotherapy work better? Because you would have to have been on a desert island for the last couple of years not to have heard that there is a new therapy now as one of the central pillars of how we treat patients with cancer, um, and that is immunotherapy. And in recognition of the funding that we have received from Oracle Cancer Trust, but also I would like to recognize um, the funding that we received from the Mark Donegan, Donegan Foundation, um, and especially to thank Deirdre, who is here in the audience tonight, um, for that ongoing support which is so valuable for which we are very appreciative. So you may have seen a picture of these two um, gentlemen in the in the newspapers or on the TV um, last week. Um, the man on, on the left is Professor Jim Allison and the man on the right is Professor Tasuko Honjo. These gentlemen won the Nobel Prize and this was the Nobel Prize for the development of immunotherapy. So I'm going to try to explain to you why they won the Nobel Prize or for what they won the Nobel Prize. Um, but I am also going to point out to you um, how it doesn't take us the full way to curing cancer and how we need to develop new treatments that may get us a little bit further uh, in terms of this. And so, phew, thank God for that, the cells do appear. Um, when I arrived here this, e this evening, um, some of this was blank. So um, this is the first part of the story. So this is the central bit about how we make immune responses. So as you may have gleaned from previous talks or you may already have worked out for yourselves, cancers are different from normal cells and therefore, in theory, our immune system should be able to get rid of them. And the way that we make immune responses is fairly straightforward. Um, so on the left-hand side, the starry-shaped cell is something called a dendritic cell and its job is to tell the circular cell on the right that there's something that it needs to do something about. And the messages go something like this. The dendritic cell says to the T cell, which is the one on the right, there's something to deal with, and we call that signal one. But it's not enough just to send one signal, because you could accidentally set off that T cell if you only needed to send one signal. So there are fail-safe mechanisms. The T cell needs to receive a second signal, which is signal two. And this is the seriously, I'm not joking, you need to get on with this. There's something going on here. And actually, the T cell is still a little bit unconvinced by this whole thing, and it needs a further um, inducement to go and do its job. And then it receives something called signal three. And this is sent from cells in the environment around where that T cell is being jump started. And it's signal three, and it's basically the what are you waiting for signal. So assuming that that works, the T cell would go off and do its job. But unfortunately, in patients with cancer, this very frequently fails to work. And so what happens is signal one comes in, something to deal with, but the signal two misfires. And the signal two comes as a signal that says, actually, I was wrong. You can stand down. There's nothing wrong going on here. We don't fully understand why this happens in patients with cancer, but it does. And it was for this, this understanding around a molecule called CTLA-4 that does this second aberrant signal that Jim Allison was nominated and therefore received the Nobel Prize. But let's go back to the first scenario. That round cell, the T cell, has received signal one, two, and three, and it's gone out into the world, into the bloodstream, to go and hunt for something that's wrong. And let's say that that's a cancer. And so when that T cell meets the other round cell, and I'm sorry, I'm no artist, so these are two round cells. One is a cancer cell, the other one is the T cell. On my picture, one is darker than the other, but that's not helping you at the minute, I promise you. But that T cell has mechanisms whereby it can attack and kill that cancer cell. Um, and that 
is something that we like to happen because, of course, it's part of potentially preventing cancers occurring in the first place or treating them when they do get established. But the problem is that within our own bodies, of course, we have mechanisms for switching off immune responses, and you'd want that to happen. When you get the flu at the age of five or six, you don't want still to be having an immune response against that flu ten years later when it's long gone. We have mechanisms for switching off our immune responses. Um, but unfortunately, tumor cells can use those same mechanisms to switch off immune responses. And so the tumor can send a signal back to that T cell, which basically says, leave me alone and go to sleep, or even worse, die. And that happens. And this is what um, Professor Honjo discovered. And this is a molecule called PD-1 and PDL one which is responsible for standing down in an activated immune response. So of course, what the great therapeutic gains that have occurred over the last five years have been treatments that can block this anti block the CTLA4 signal that Jim Allison discovered, or block the PD1 PDL1 signal that Professor Honjo discovered. And very justifiably, they have won the Nobel Prize, and many, many patients are alive today and potentially cured of their disease because of that. But unfortunately, those treatments work in about 15 to 20 percent of patients with common cancers, and the sort of cancers that we are interested in in this room will respond to these treatments on about between 10 and 15 percent of occasions. And so we need to do better. So how are we going to do that? With the help of Oracle Cancer Trust and with the Mark Donner Foundation, we have been working on this. And so here I want to recognize the work of, um, of people who've been working in my lab for a long time and for whom I am, to whom I am deeply grateful. Um, this is Joan Kaula, Vicky Ralston, and Martin McLaughlin, two of whom are in the audience tonight. And the pictures there in the middle that's a picture of an old friend of ours called Rio virus. Now, this is a virus that we have been working with for a long time, and it's a virus that has been in the clinic, and a virus that we hope we will be taking to further trials within the clinic uh, with an interesting strategy that I'm about to, to share with you, a number of interesting strategies I'm going to share with you. But this virus is capable of infecting cancer cells and killing them. And what we are now learning through their work is that it also acts as a means of activating immune responses, and I'm going to show how that works. At least I'm going to try to show how it works. So please go and visit the posters of these individuals and they will explain in detail what this graph um, represents. It's called a waterfall plot and of course it looks nothing like a waterfall um, but it shows where the red dots are those are indications of where we have done, where they have done an experiment, where they combined the virus, Rio virus, with a number of different drugs, including experimental drugs, which are used in the laboratories, but some of which are approved for the treatment of cancer. And those red dots indicate places where the amount of cancer cells that have been killed are far, far above what you would anticipate. And so those red dots indicate what we call synergy, where one plus one suddenly equals five in terms of killing. And so this is a really important interaction between a drug and a virus to kill cancer cells. So what Vicky and Joe have done is they've looked at what the reasons for this were. Now, if you look at a plate of cancer cells, now this is a plate of, of cancer cells that have been treated with, some have been treated with virus, some have been treated with a drug, and the name of the drug doesn't specifically matter, um, but it's a drug f that we think have, has a great deal of potential um, for development in combination with, uh, with virus therapies. Now, what you can see from there is you can see that they look a little bit different, but it's very, very difficult to understand exactly what's going on in those cells. So what Vicky and Joe and others in the team have done is they've collected those cells and they've subjected them to a a technique which is fiendishly cunning and very complicated and which I could not possibly explain to you how it works. But nonetheless, what it tells us is what's going on in terms of the protein levels within those cells. Now, the first thing that they have discovered, and we know that cells can be thought of perhaps as factories. So these pictures on the left indicate factory functions in cells. So here you can see 
I don't know, a petrochemical factory, a car factory. But most importantly, at the bottom, you can see, as we know, I hope we don't see too often in the future, but those of us who were around in the 70s and 80s saw plenty of this, factories can go on strike. And one of the things that we can potentially do is we can try to put factories on strike, and we're learning that that might be a good way to activate immune responses. And so what Joe and Vic and others have discovered is that's exactly what happens when we use this drug combination with virus therapy. So all of those stripes, and you can see there, there are six vertical stripes, I hope you can see, with various shades of green and red. The one on the far left, as you look, is the normal situation. The one on the far right is when you combine the drug and the virus at the doses that we think are most appropriate. And what you can see without knowing all the details is they are chalk and cheese. So where it is green on the left, it's gone red on the right, and where it's red on the left, it's gone green on the, on the right. What that indicates is that we have completely screwed up the function of the factory. And what that means is that potentially that factory is going to show proteins on the surface that might not otherwise show and those might be of great interest to the immune system and that's, that's exactly what we think is happening. So this indicates the fact that that disordering of the factory function can actually act as a major red flag to the immune response. So that's exactly what we see. And again, in the experiments that they have conducted, and this is looking at those cancer cells under the microscope, the blue dots are the nucleus, the DNA within cancer cells. The green blobs around them are proteins on the surface. And this is a specific test for a protein called calreticulin, which is shown on the surface of cells when they make themselves visible to the immune system. And not only just visible to the immune system, but potentially tasty to the immune system. The immune system might want to eat those cells. And you can see there that in the bottom, if there's the arrow is showing, in the bottom panel here, these are the greenest cells, and that's where the virus and the drug have been added together. Disordering the factory function, putting proteins on the surface, making these cells potentially tasty to the immune system. So what's going to happen next? The immune system is going to eat some of those cancer cells. And again, this is an assay that's been done by, by Joe and Vic, and I have to thank Dave Mansfield, who isn't in the audience tonight. He's at home recovering from the severe blood loss we've induced in him, because he had to give multiple blood samples in order for us to purify cells that could eat um, these cancer cells. And so what you see here is when a cancer cell has been eaten by one of Dave's immune cells called a macrophage, you see a red blob. And you can see here when we've got the drug and the virus together, you see far more red blobs than you do when you have neither the virus nor the drug. What we're showing here is that those signals on the surface, the so-called eat me signals, make the immune system gobble up those tumor cells and potentially show them to the immune system and re make an immune response. And what we see then is we see um, an activation of a sentry or a guard response or a reaction to that event. Again, more of these proteins. So these are different proteins now. Again, the same sort of format, green and red, this time four stripes, two different doses of virus uh, with or without the drug. So either no virus or some virus. And again, you can see where it's green on the left, it's gone red on the right and vice versa. And this indicates the fact that that function of activating an immune response has led to a profound change in the way the cell is being seen by the immune system. And this is the so-called interferon response. Now, interferon is the main way that our body has of activating immune responses. And so we show that this combination is capable of doing this. Now, the next slide, um, now this is not a slide in honor of the West Ham fans in the audience. So these, this is to remind me, and I apologize for that, Bob, I couldn't work Fulham into the talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is to remind me that what we've also seen is an unexpected finding of something bubbling up out of the genes within the cell. And this is a completely unexpected observation. And again, this is the work of um, Vicky and Joe and also Jyoti Chowdhury, who works in the lab next door to us. And what this has shown us, actually, is that when we combine the drug and the virus together, hidden viruses that live and in fact are part of our own genomes, so-called retroviruses that form about 30% of our own DNA, suddenly switch on and start releasing within these cancer cells RNA species, so 
other types of nucleic acid, which are profoundly activating to the immune response. So what we think that we're able to induce with these two combination treatments is the perfect storm that will wake up immune responses. And we are testing this we have tested this in animal models, and we've seen profound effects against the tumor. We're looking at this as a potential opportunity to go into clinical trials, and we've opened discussions um, with the pharmaceutical company that makes the drug, Pfizer, um, and with the company that makes the virus, Oncolytics, and we hope very much that we will be able to take this to patients within the next year or two, and that will be as a direct uh, uh, result of work that has been sponsored and funded by Oracle Cancer Trust and the Mark Donegan Foundation. I'd like to close with just one other story, which I think is a very exciting story, which is again another thing that is being funded um, by Oracle Cancer Trust. Um, and so this is a special therapy, and everyone, Vin will know what I'm, what I'm about to say here, but does anyone know what this therapy is likely to be called? Sting, of course, it's Sting. So this is the Sting therapy. So this stands for the stimulator of interferon genes. I've already told you that interferon is important. So we have been working with a pharmaceutical partner that makes a molecule that is called a Sting agonist, which means if you inject it into a patient's tumor, it turns on interferon responses. This is a patient who we have been treating now for about the last year. This gentleman presented to us in extremis with a huge tumor in his thyroid gland, a type of cancer called an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma that has an average survival of somewhere around six weeks. This gentleman entered the study, and you can see here big lumps of tumor in the area of his airway. This man was on the verge of needing um, a tracheostomy to help to help him breathe. And you can see over the period of about nine months, that tumor has pretty much gone away. A remarkable response with this therapy. Um, and here he is, actually, around about here. He's a, a semi-professional oboist, again returning to concert activity, playing his oboe in a concert. This drug is another drug that turns on immune responses and is working with those PD-1 drugs I told you about right at the very beginning. And again, we're doing work in the laboratory to try to understand some of these mechanisms. And again, that is being supported by the Oracle Cancer Trust. So we couldn't do any of this work without the support of Oracle, and we couldn't do it without your support, for which we remain deeply grateful and very, very thankful.